Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and we've got another great one for you this evening, Bob Spearing. And I got to meet him when I was in Pine Bush. Oh, uh, what was that? It's going on two years ago now. Uh, but anyway, uh, he's a great guy, and we're going to be talking about all sorts of things. Uh, he's been very involved in MUFON, and I'm going to actually be going to the MUFON Symposium coming up on August 24th through the 27th, and that's just outside of Cincinnati. And I hope that if you are planning to be there, you can look me up uh, at the conference itself. And so our blog this week is, uh, let's see, it's a 1970 UFO and humanoid report from Spain, another really interesting one by uh, Charles Lear. And so check that out on podcastufo.com. And let's see, I think we're about ready just to jump in and get started here with my guest. Hey, Bob, welcome to the show. How are you, Martin? I'm good doing well. Again. Doing well. I can hear you and everything. But <laughs> okay, good. Well, that's what, that's what's important. Yeah, good to have you on board. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to this symposium. And uh, this is the last one I went to was Cherry Hill way back, and Lou Elizondo was there. I'm trying to think what year that was. 2018. 2018. I was field investigator of the year that year. Oh, is that right? So what what does it take to become the field investigator of the year? Well, they actually have uh, uh, so not they have like a formula based on how many cases you do, how many unknowns versus IFOs versus hoaxes, insufficient data, and I came out on the top of the class as having the most uh, reliable uh, dispositions for refund cases that year. Now tell me, uh, you just mentioned the word hoaxes. I would I would imagine that the reports to move on that are hoaxes are fairly low. Do I have that wrong? I'd say they're fairly low. Yeah, well, well under 10%. I'd say probably 6% at most. And when it's hoaxes, is it someone just trying to be funny or are they really, you know, I mean, do they really go into it? I mean, have you had to deal with some of these yourself? Yeah, one of the cases of, of interest that we're going to show at the symposium is actually from an airline pilot who claimed he was over Georgia at 37,000 feet when a uh, large chevron passed over his plane with multicolored lights. But what a lot of these hoaxers don't realize is that we can go into the metadata of videos and photographs and we can actually see whether or not he was over Georgia at 37,000 feet. And in this particular case, uh, he didn't get away with it where he was. And it, it's sort of embarrassing that somebody with that much expertise in a professional that's actually piloting a plane would perpetrate a hoax. But the majority of hoaxes are people that just send us outlandish photographs or we, ha we have what's called keystroke events where they just make up a, some sort of outlandish tale and you can pretty much tell right away whether it's 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 a hoax or not. Well, you know, one, one of the things, I don't know if this happens to you, but it happens to me quite often. And I don't, I'm not trying to say anything negative about the people that send me um, things. And I also, uh, I just started this, uh, a voicemail uh, message that you can actually, it's right on my website. If anyone wants to leave me their encounter in a voice message, I have that on podcastufo.com. You'll see it um, under UFO sightings. I have a lot of really great sightings that people have reported to me anonymously and some, you know, you know, username. Some of them are airline pilots. So that's just on my website. Someone wants to talk about that. You can check that out. Um, so, um, I forget what I was talking about, <laughs> where I was going with oh, this. Oh, uh, we, we were talking about the 2018 symposium. Yeah. Yeah. I lost my train of thought. It's the guests that's supposed to do that. Not me, but <laughs> anyway, uh, so I, I might, I might remember as we go along here, but, um, so I got distracted by the new voice message thing I have here. Um, but anyway, um, I, I do believe it was how people report. I think that's that's what I was uh, where I was going with this whole thing. When uh, when people have a UFO sighting, generally speaking, 
they're they're pretty solid but it doesn't mean that necessarily what they see you know we may get like 10 percent of them that are something that need to be looked at you know but i know exactly what i was going to say i was going to ask you do you also get pictures sent to you that are just as clear as can be and people will have these circles and there's nothing inside the circle they'll oh, say yeah. here's the ufo right here and I am looking and I expand the picture out as big as I can. I'm going to have a big screen here and I see absolutely nothing, not even a dot. That's happened many times where people will send me their UFO photos and there's absolutely nothing in them. Um, yeah, are you talking about like a white light with a donut hole in the middle of it or just nothing there? Nothing at all. And they have a circle that they put on the picture to show me where they oh. see the UFO. Yes, I, I mean, there's ways that we can enhance the, the, the photo to see if there is actually something there. And I've seen uh, plenty of those. As a matter of fact, one of the things that MUFON's going to be doing in probably the next year is releasing a gallery of drawings that people uh, submit to us. We have over 5,000 really interesting drawings. But to find them, I had to go through the entire case management system, all 132,000 cases, looking at JPEG after JPEG after JPEG. And it's astounding how many people see a tiny, tiny little dot in the air with a red circle around it that they put. Yeah. I'd say in the majority of those cases, they're mylar balloons or some sort of weather balloon that they're seeing against, say, a bright blue sky. But you have to really zoom in to see what they're actually looking at. Yeah, I've seen I've seen some of those too as well. I'm just going to pull this up for everyone uh, to see who's in YouTube and Facebook, etc. Right now, but this is uh, this is the, my UFO sightings page, and uh, there's some uh, videos. This was uh, one at at some fireworks, but these all open into larger stories. A lot of these just uh, and 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 a number of them do have. Uh, photographs in them that are pretty intriguing and those are all within the text itself if you click read more etc you'll see uh, more information but uh, but it is uh, it, it is it is amazing how many people you know you go into any type of crowd um, you know for instance I'm involved in like a, a, a guitar strumming you know type of thing uh, that's where I live where people get together and and we play guitar uh, once a week and uh it's amazing that a conversation can start and all of a sudden all these people have had a ufo sighting in this group of say 20 or 30 people there were three that came right over and was one guy knew that i did this show on ufos and he talked about it and these people came over with quite amazing sightings and it just seems like everywhere you go there's a, a part of the population that has had ufo sightings uh, yeah i just i just did my 50th uh grammar school reunion yeah. and we had 60 people and about 20 people came over to me and said hey bob we heard you're really into ufos can i tell you my ufo story this was just at my class reunion so yeah. i'd say that maybe you know one tenth of the amount of people that see UFOs actually report them. I think that there's probably millions and millions and millions of reports that we'll never know about. That's right. And you know what Ryan Graves said at the hearing last, you know, a week and a half ago or a couple of weeks ago was basically that only he thinks only 5% of pilots, military pilots will actually report and 95% of them will not because they're afraid of the ridicule, which I do. I am happy to hear is going to be much less as we move forward, hopefully. The ridicule factor yeah I, I definitely think it's it's starting to become easier for pilots to report their sightings without facing the stigma or worrying about being grounded and having to do a psychological review i mean 30 years ago that that japanese pilot near alaska yes he was grounded -A -A that. Yeah. yeah so I, I think things are changing for the better as far as pilots go and we in in our field investigator ranks we do have several commercial airline pilots and uh, they make excellent witnesses that's great and uh so i always ask this for everyone that i've interviewed for the first time uh, what sparked your interest in this topic to begin with 
Well, I had three sightings myself, pretty mundane. The third one was pretty weird. It wasn't really a UFO, but I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. When I was a kid on November 9th, 1965, there was the great Northeastern blackout from Virginia all the way up to Quebec City. And the next morning, my uncle came running over the house saying they believe UFOs were involved. And apparently, several UFOs were seen over the clay power station at Niagara Falls that night, seconds before the power went out, uh, including one uh, private pilot in Cessna who was actually looking down at the uh, power station and saw an orange orb just as the power went out all across the eastern seaboard. So that originally is what piqued my interest. I started buying the gold key UFO comics in the 60s, the saga magazines in the 70s. And in 86, I was camping at a remote spot in northern New Jersey, uh, Round Valley Reservoir. Two o'clock in the morning, raining heavily. I'm sitting on the beach on an overturned canoe in a poncho. And a friend of of mine and myself, we saw this orb. And at the time, I didn't know what an orb was. And it was just hanging over the lake for about 10 minutes. And then it began to do crazy maneuvers, upside down question marks going all over. And then it just shot off at the speed of light. And it wasn't until Terry Ray wrote a book on uh, orbs, the orange yeah. orb phenomenon, that I, I said to myself, my goodness, somebody else knows about these things. And th that was 2013. I went to see him in, uh, I think it was Pittsburgh, and, because I wanted to talk to him. And he told me all about MUFON, and that's how I got into MUFON. The really? second, yeah, yeah. Sighting, second sighting was I was on a train going from Jersey City to Newark, 12 noon, bright, sunny day out. And I looked out the window at a train, and there was this silver sphere pacing the train at 60 miles an hour, maybe half a mile out, maybe half a mile high. And it was clearly a round cylindrical object keeping pace with the train going across the New Jersey meadows. And once we hit the Newark skyline, it just shot up and over and disappeared over the, the skyscrapers. But the weirdest one was uh, probably 2012. I was coming back from Quebec in the dead of winter through the Adirondacks where Lake Placid is very, very remote. I was the only one on the highway. Very mountainous, lots of pine trees, lots of snow. And there was a break in the trees and there was a sheer cliff on the side of the road. And I saw what looked like a tank with triangular wheels climbing up a sheer cliff. It was probably the size of two, um, uh, two tractor trailers together. And it was just someplace a machine like that should never have been. And I never saw anything like it in my entire life. It was the weirdest. I did a U-turn, went back to see if I could catch it, it was gone. But I'm telling you, it was nothing that I ever could imagine being made by humans. And it was just climbing up this cliff. It was the strangest thing I ever saw. Wow. That is bizarre. I really like the bizarre ones though. So, uh, now, I know you do, there, there's a couple of questions that I'll, I'll pop up here and there, but I know you, you've done a lot of uh, work on the, the balls of light yourself and historically and all that. And uh, last week I had uh, Christopher Bledsoe on and I got a little bit of grief. People were saying, you know, um, that uh, they were saying not nice things uh, to me about Chris and why did I have him on here? Why was I exploiting him if, if he, you know, has issues, that type of thing. But all they had to do is to see uh, the videos that he's recorded and the History Channel recorded at his at his home. And you can see these orbs of light and they're doing weird things, you know, over him constantly. And then I had someone write me and say they think it's more of a paranormal thing than than a uh, UFO type thing. And they made the point where, you know, um, that the, a lot of times these orbs are inside the house or, you know, in, in like other types of closed quarters uh, where uh, a backyard and, and coming up to, you know, right up to someone's face and things like that. So maybe they are more the paranormal, whatever they are, they're unexplainable. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I've studied them a long time and I, I have a tendency to believe that it's it's three or four different phenomena uh some of it may be ball lightning which is just a natural phenomenon but some people have encountered ball lightning where when it gets close to them a person will react and scream and the ball lightning will shoot away as if it had some sort of 
rudimentary intelligence, okay? There was a guy in the 50s, uh, Trevor Constable, who believed that they were actually creatures living in the upper atmosphere. Uh, when people have uh, encountered orbs, some people have tried to surround them, and they'll always back away from people. They'll move up if they feel uh, trapped. So it makes me think that one possibility is they could be some sort of uh, life form endemic to Earth that we just don't understand yet because it may be plasma-based. All right. Other people have encounters where these orbs, in a sort of a paranormal way, will actually turn into beings. In one case in South America, a uh, man was on his deck and sees an orb, two orbs come down to his deck. He was suffering from cancer. They turn into two little people. They go, this one is sick, heal him. And suddenly his cancer disappears and they turn into balls of light again and you know, take off. And when he goes to the doctor, his cancer is cured. So that's a second aspect of it. And the third aspect of it is that I think in some cases, these are actual plasma encased of uh, structures um, that are possibly robotic. A good example is the case with the FedEx uh, airplane flying from uh, Mexico City to Tennessee a couple of years ago. It actually made network TV where the object paced the plane for 33 minutes, and when they reached the border of the United States, the object made a right turn and shut off. And later on, I was speaking with Ted Rowe from NARCAP, and he believes that in that particular case, it may have been an actual craft wrapped in a plasma because plasma will absorb a radar signal, and that maybe it was a way to avoid detection because the pilot actually panned down from filming the object out his window to his TCAS anti-collision radar, and it wasn't there. So the third type of phenomenon, I think that these plasma balls might be, might be actually craft that are disguised to avoid radar. Wow, wow. Uh, well, whatever they are, I, I think you're right. I think there could be multiple explanations for these things. I mean, it just seems like that, I mean, how can anyone say? I mean, we don't even know what's going on. I really, I think that part that you just said there a minute ago where, it's a possibility that it's some type of life that we don't know about, you know, kind of uh, reminds me of some things that I've heard people say over the years. And I do believe uh, even Lou Elizondo mentioned something about something might be here that exists here that we don't even, you know, uh, I forget exactly what he said, but of a very high intelligence. But I don't know, I wouldn't think that these things, if they were a life form, you know, they seem to be uh, enough to get out of the way of something, but I don't see any other type of intelligence or hear about anything. Uh, well, the, the, the ones that are the strangest are the ones that turn into actual uh, uh, beings, all right? Yeah. And it, it, yeah. if, you, if you're familiar with Albert Rosales, he has like 14 books of humanoid sightings throughout history, 2,000 years, and they're fascinating. And he literally has probably close to 100 uh, encounters in his books of orbs that turn into some sort of beings. So there's definitely something to that phenomenon. Yes, there's a, there is a, a story that I was told from someone that was on this show, I think maybe seven or eight years ago, and I can't recall who it was, but they interviewed a woman that was in her 80s. She was perfectly okay. She, In other words, she was no signs of senility or anything like that. And she said that she watched this orb in her backyard move around and all of a sudden now this where it gets really crazy it it turned into what looked like a bigfoot <laughs> you know so is that kind of what you're talking about you know what yeah, i mean uh, yes not uh, not yeah not, not only say little humanoids or you know tall blonde nordics but there albert definitely has several cases where these orbs turned into bigfoot and we know that many is times that right they, Bigfoot are seen in conjunction with with the UFO reports. Yep, the yep, Bigfoot the orbs have turned into Bigfoots. Yes. <laughs> so it's not. I mean, as crazy as it sounds, other people have reported the same. I mean, if I saw something like that, I think I'd be very nervous to actually talk about it. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, it's so hard to believe. But but so so much of what we look into is so very hard to believe. Um. So let's let's talk just quickly. I want to bring up uh, the symposium, who the speakers are, and uh, I'm really looking forward to going. I'm really excited about going. So let's see. Sure. So that, our, 
our, our keynote speaker is going to be David Polides, who yeah. wrote the 411 series of books. I've read two of them, uh, and they're fascinating, especially uh, the stories about the children who are found always near some sort of, you know, berry bush and you know that they're in impossible places where a, a baby would have drowned trying to get to a little island so i always found his i know it's uh, fascinating that there are definitely places like up near vancouver that are hot spots for these things and we've had some very strange cases at mufon ourselves from the, the vancouver uh nanaimo area all right so i look forward to him uh he'll be our banquet speaker uh we also will have let me just so let's just pause here for a second on on sure. him. now when i met him in 2018 in cherry hill i was next to him in the booth right next to him and we talked quite a bit that evening and i said hey would you ever be on my show and talk about ufos and he goes no no no. i want you know i'm really into this 411 and i don't want to mix it up and you know all that so now he has a book with the ufo connection <laughs> and i've been trying to reach him i'm going to be talking to him at the event but i've been trying to reach him to okay now let's talk about ufos finally but uh, right right he did he did seem to to change his attitude towards ufos over the past couple of years that that is interesting yeah yep yeah. so we have uh, avi Loeb. he'll be uh he will be i i talked to him today he will be not he won't be there in person but he will be there uh via internet right yeah, he's going to live live stream. The, the problem was that this year it just so happened that his book publisher, I believe, decided to put his book out the same weekend that the MUFON symposium was happening, so he couldn't appear in person. Uh, but yeah, right now he just came back from his expedition in yeah. the ocean trying to recover pieces of that possible uh, meteorite that may actually be the remnants of a crashed you know crash debris from a ufo and he brought back a couple of very interesting specimens that i believe they're they're analyzing now that seem to uh be of a composition that would not be possible with the human technology we have right now well the one thing i like uh very much about what he intends to do is he intends to be transparent about everything and i think that's very important and i think that you know i mean i really i enjoy every time i talk to him he's a fascinating guy and uh i you know he thinks sort of like a, a child the curiosity of a child and um, i mean that all in a good way <laughs> and uh thiago i had uh, him on the show years ago real nice guy i'm looking forward to meeting him Yes, he's a very, very, very nice guy, family man. Um, he is our national director of Brazil. And as you know, the the people of Brazil have a, a great interest in, in U, UFOs, ufology. Yeah. So he's just, he's just a giant down there in South America. Yes. And uh, speaking of uh, Brazil and the Varginha case is really interesting. Uh, and it's possible... Uh, I'm going to give him a lot of grief if he doesn't make it, but I think I'm going to have James Fox on next week. I do believe so. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that. Michael Masters, I enjoy talking to him, hung out with him uh, out in Phoenix. He's a great guy. Now, for those of you who don't know or have just watched us for the first time, he has a theory of that these are these, what we're seeing is time travelers coming back, which I think is a really fascinating. You know, it's as good as any other idea. If you got, if you ask. Yeah, me. I, I, I also am a person who leans towards time travelers, and I write a lot about uh, what they might be coming back for. Uh, I have a number of different theories on it myself, but I, I definitely like Michael Masters' approach to it. I think it's fresh. I think it's different, and I think there's a lot of validity that it could be humans from the future. Uh, or and to add a, a, a crinkle to that, I think it could be humans from the past too. But I won't go into that anymore till I write my book. So, oh yeah, well that's an interesting thing. Linda Zimmerman, a lovely woman, and I've seen uh, I've uh, seen her at many. Uh, events over the years and and uh, had her on the show a number of times. She's a wonderful, uh, wonderful speaker. I'll always, uh, always enjoy hearing what she has to say. And uh, the contact humans and animals, that one is another fascinating topic, if you ask me. I met her at Pine Bush several years ago. Very, very nice lady. I, yeah. she ordered, 
autographed my book. Yeah, and I, I, I'm like 45 minutes from Pinebush, so I'm in the Hudson. I'm on the edge of the Hudson Valley, and there's a lot of you know strange things go on up here too. But yeah, she's a very, very, very nice person, and, and I think she's an important person in the ufology. Yeah, and I, I don't know if I've had Raymond on my show or not. That's terrible. I've had a lot of people. Sometimes I actually forget, but I don't think I've had him on my show. Uh, I don't know if he's uh, if he has made the rounds in uh, in radio world or not. No, I you know the, he's somebody that I'm waiting to see. I've never seen him speak, so I'm I'm very curious to hear him in person. So he's he's the one one speaker I really don't know that well, uh, but I I know he he has a lot of very interesting ideas. Yeah, and I've heard her name for years. Uh, Terry Ling, I don't even know how to pronounce her last name. Terry Lynn Kell, she's one Kell. of our board of directors. She's a, a, an experiencer herself. She has very, very interesting uh, experiences in her lifetime. And I know her very well, and I'm sure she's going to definitely entertain people who listen to her uh, when she talks about her own experiences and, and how it, it has healed her. Yeah. And then we have Barbara Sohani. So Bar Barbara, Barbara is our uh, uh, MUFON journal editor. She's John Schussler's daughter. So if oh, you want wow. a firsthand account um, about UFO encounters, because she has worked with her father for decades, uh, you're going to get a lot of the scientific side of things if you come to listen to her speak. Wow, isn't that something? And Mike's been on the show three, four times, I think. He's he's a great guy, and he'll be fun to hang out with. Mike Cleland does uh, Owls and UFO Contact. Grant Cameron, a number of, he's been on the show also a number of times. And that guy can put out some some uh, data. <laughs> I, 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 have, I have a number of Grant's books. I really think Grant is on target, too, to be perfectly honest. He has some interesting thoughts, that's for sure. And Yvonne Smith, always nice to see her. So that's the lineup, and that's going to be a really good – I'm really excited to be there uh, coming up at the end of this month. So uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, UFO investigations that you have done. You mentioned that you – 2018, you were investigator. Uh, was it National Investigator of the Year? Is that what it was? Yeah, we just have uh, uh, in, uh, investigator of the year. It's, they could be from any country, any state. So, um, yeah, I've had a, a number of ones, and I've done a lot of research on cases. Uh, one of the things that I'm blessed to be able to do is have absolute total access to the CMS, the case management system at MUFON, and we have 132,000 cases in it. Um, I'm I'm I love old historical cases. And I'm also a patterns guy. So I'm always looking for patterns in UFO cases. And some of the ones that we're going to be doing at the symposium in the cases of interest presentation are when I do this research and we'll pick a case from 2022, for example, that's very interesting. And we'll try to find correlating cases. One of the fascinating things that, of course, happened this year in February is that after the Chinese balloon was shot down on February 3rd, the following week, three other objects were shot down over North America on February 10th, 11th, and 12th. And we've really never gotten an answer on what they shot down, if indeed they shot down anything. Uh, one was over the tundra in Alaska. One was over the uh, forest in the Yukon in Canada. And one was 17 miles across the Canadian border into the United States in Lake Huron. And what's interesting about that is that the pilot over Lake Huron needed two Sidewinder missiles to take it out. He described it as small and he described it as an octagon. And if you saw the arrow hearings, Dr. Kirkpatrick was describing that what they're zeroing in on are objects under five meters in length or width, which is approximately 15 feet or smaller the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. And we got an enormous number of cases this year uh, of objects that were in that size range, including this octagon that was shot down allegedly as the pilot described over Lake Huron. 
So I went in and I did some research on uh, octagons because the CMS will allow you to do keyword searches. And what I found was absolutely fascinating and absolutely scary. And in a nutshell, one of the things I'm going to present at the symposium is that we in the past several years have been overrun with octagon shaped objects and there's a particular size uh, of an octagon usually about 60 feet in diameter and we may have actually uh, correlated at least in one case uh, this to MADAR sightings Fran Ridge's MADAR group that has this series of probes around the United States that try to uh, capture changes in barometric pressure and compass mad compass swings in the electromagnetic field suggesting something came into the atmosphere and apparently these octagons might be coming straight in from outer space which would be very very scary and unusual now wouldn't we have some type of satellite that would track something like that Oh, of course, but you know, the United States government said that they gave up the search after five days for this, which I, I don't believe at all, because where this object went down uh, over Lake Huron, it's about 145 feet deep, and they said they can't find it. But a submersible implodes in 12,000 feet of water in a search field that's the size of Connecticut, and they find it in three days and actually retrieve the, the submersible two days later, but they can't find something in 145 feet of water. I'd say that um, I'm not anticipating, you know, a total disclosure from the government anytime soon. And I got in trouble for saying that last week, um, but that's just my opinion. That's not the opinion of MUFON. Well, uh... I, I tend to agree with you. I mean, if they, it seems to me like they would really want to look and find what it was, unless they already somehow knew what it was, that type of thing. This is uh, when they retrieved the Chinese, the spy balloon, and uh, the people that uh, listen to the show all the time uh, know that I was actually right underneath it when it was shot. Um, I just happened to be in Myrtle Beach. <laughs> and looked up and there it was, it got out of the car and the thing was shot right in front of me, which was really bizarre, and, but yeah. Oh, and they retrieved that from, I think 110 feet of water in the Atlantic within a day, they knew exactly where it was. Yep. And, the, and the Chinese wanted it back. They said, we want our balloon back. Something that I don't think anybody ever thinks about is nobody has asked for any of the three objects that were shot down back. Not Russia, not China, not Iran, not anybody. So, you know, who do they belong to, the other three objects? Well, one of them, I think one of them was like a student type of situation, I do believe, unless I have that wrong. Did you uh, Did you hear that? Yeah, I heard that, that one of them was a, uh, a hobby balloonist balloon that was from a club in i think it was indiana or ohio but the problem with that theory is that the object that was shot down over lake huron was first spotted the day before coming from montana so i don't know if the gulf stream goes west to east how somebody in indiana or ohio could have a, a hobby balloon coming from montana towards them so i have issues with some of those those student hobby club balloon theories Ah, yeah. Okay. I'm just going to pop this question up. Uh, I mentioned this before we went on, you know, on the air. Uh, if you knew anything about it, Bob, you have not heard anything about this. This is, uh, there's news out of Peru that there's some type of attacks going on. And I actually uh, been talking with Ben Hanson a little bit about that. He's uh, supposedly says the police are actually involved in it. What it is, I have no idea. But, uh, and speaking of that, my guest from uh, that had a Peru incident is coming up on on September 5th. Just giving that a little plug, Jonathan Wygant will be on the show on September 5th. And that was a military encounter in Peru. Uh, lots of people are very familiar with um, his talk that he did about 2001, somewhere around there, maybe 2003. Uh, he talked about the incident back then. Here's a question that came up a while back. Can, Bob, can you give a comparative current numbers of sightings, point, uh, light versus disc spheres, things like that? Uh, well, I can tell you that over the past several decades, the number of points of light has increased and the number of 
disks and spheres has decreased precipitously. Um, also, we find a lot of triangles, but if you look at the statistics for triangles, it has been really steady uh, for about 20 years now of how, about how many triangles we get. But the number of disks is without doubt going down. The number of sites of points of light at night is going up. Part of that, I believe, is that people uh, all have cell phone cameras now. And when they see something at night, they're clicking on it. Unfortunately, most of the photos we get for points of light at night are, are essentially useless because they're out of focus because the camera is trying to focus on uh, a, an infinite black background so you really cannot tell what the person is actually trying to photograph or film in a lot of these cases um another one cigars have gone down precipitously but at the same time people are mistaking trains of Starlink satellites for long cylindrical objects with portholes when actually it's just disparate points of, of 60 lights in the sky flying overhead. Yeah, so what what would you say, this is a, I'm gonna bring in a, uh, let's see, is this right? Yeah, I'm gonna bring in Stan Gordon, uh, gets a lot of reports himself out of Pennsylvania and this just happened back in August 3rd, and I can put this also in the show notes so people can see it. But it was a large, it's a very, a very good witness that did this really nice detailed drawing. And it's the typical one, you know, that you hear about the silent and then the uh, lights on the corners and a larger light in the center. And a lot of people argue that they think those are military and, uh, you know, secret military. And what is your opinion on that? Well, uh, if you're familiar with Charles Fort, and I'm sure you are, he wrote a book um, back around 1920 where he had UFO reports of triangles back in the 1800s and the 1890s. In David Marler's book, Estimate of the Situation About Triangles, yeah. there is a drawing from a 1964 or 1965 newspaper article that shows exactly what you just showed me. And probably the proof that this is a real phenomenon is the 5,000 drawings that I was just telling you about earlier that MUFON is putting together that's going to be a drawing gallery for members sometime probably early next year and I can tell you there's probably three or four hundred triangle drawings over decades that look exactly like what you just put up by Stan Gordon. How about that? Now the uh, the kind of the complaints that I hear about MUFON are people will say things to me like, why can't we access the database? But it has a lot to do with anonymity, right? With the uh, witnesses, mostly? Yeah, th th there's, there's a couple of things going on. Uh, for example, we, we were getting a lot of piracy, okay? And um, people were stealing our cases. So we have to keep them behind a, a paywall for members only. And members can access and do searches up to 50 cases at a time. And they can access search parameters like year, month, date, shape, color. Uh, they just can't see the total investigation that the a uh, field investigator will do because we have to keep the witnesses anonymous. And that's doubly true for people who are experiencers that come to us seeking answers. Uh, the other issue right now is we're revamping the CMS. We're moving it to a new server. And right now we have a technical difficulty in, in showing certain things that a member would see, such as the city. We can show the county. But because of the changes we're doing, we're moving to a latitude longitude system because uh, a lot of times people who are witnesses, when they submit a case, they don't know how to spell the name of the town, for example, and we can't find it on a map. So we're going to a drop down menu so that the the cities will be spelled exactly and they can be pinpointed to latitude and longitude on a map for another project we're doing. So there's a temporary problem that will be fixed very shortly, but you can't see everything that a field investor could see if you remember, but if you're the public, you can't see anything at all at this point because uh, Facebook and YouTube are just stealing everything from us. And that, that, that hurts us when we work with television production companies. Oh, I, absolutely. Uh, this, Stephen has written about this uh, question a couple of times. And I don't know, the, uh, the, the curiosity I have about his question here is how about the, 
football field size red rectangle from the UFO hearing that uh, I, I believe Matt Gates was talking to Ryan Graves about it. Um, now, uh, my question about this is, are you familiar with this being reported to move on? Uh, no, I, I, I just I, I read that about the red rectangle. Uh, but we have a lot of rectangle reports, and some of them are red, some of them are different colors, some of them are yellow. Um, and it's been going on a long time. When I was at my uh, class reunion, uh, one of the people that came up to me to tell me their story was they were on an airplane in 2010 going to a wedding near California, and he saw what looked like a yellow square coming towards the plane. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it th he said, my God, this thing's going to hit us. Suddenly the plane dove, came back up, and when they landed, he went to the pilots and said, did you see that? And they go, sir, if you want to file a report, go to the FAA office at the end of the hall. We don't want to have anything to do with it. Yeah. So I, I can tell you that in our files, we have rectangles and we have red rectangles and we have yellow rectangles and we have black rectangles, etc. Amazing. And how long, once you have a sighting, how long do you have to report it? Like, can you report something that was years ago? Yes. As a matter of fact, I do a lot of genealogy. And back in the 90s, before I belonged to MUFON, I was looking at baptism registers from Jersey City, New Jersey, and I found an 1864 account uh, of a cross in the sky, illuminated cross in the sky, flying over lower Manhattan. And the woman who uh, told it to her parish priest. He wrote it in the footnotes of the baptism register, and he even drew a picture of it, and it looked like an airplane with an illuminated cockpit. I submitted that to MUFON before I really knew what MUFON was all about. It ended up being the earliest report that MUFON ever had uh, of a UFO, and I even submitted the the, the drawing and the baptism register page. So yes, we get a lot of people who wait 30, 40, 50 years to report things. And the, the scary thing about it is that a lot of these people who are adults are reporting things when they were children. When I was seven years old, this happened to me. When I was 10, and I have always thought it was a little creepy how many reports we get of schoolyard encounters, of reports from uh, people who were children when this happened, that there's definitely uh, an interest in children as far as whoever is piloting these objects sort of creepy yeah no no it makes i mean uh preston dennett did a book um i think over 105 school yard mm -hmm. you know sightings and mm -hmm. since then you know he's found more and then i had someone from oakland contact me and you know told me about his schoolyard sighting back in the 1970s that he and someone else saw it was a gold colored object you know that one have you ever heard of someone say he said it looked just like it was plated with gold yes i've heard that many times you have yes. all right since you have since you're familiar with all these i'm going to tell you what i saw and see if you've ever heard of anything like it i sure. i had basically it was a perfectly shaped disc now as in i was looking up so i couldn't see the side of it whether it had a dome on the top or not but I mean, it had a light blue glow around the entire thing, like mm -hmm. a, like a field or something around the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of anything like that? Yes, I have. If if you go into the CMS and do a keyword search for say blue or blue disc, uh, you will get numerous hits. A lot of times they believe it has something to do with the propulsion system. All right. Uh, sometimes when UFOs are seen coming or going, they change color or they'll have a luminosity around them that may be some sort of field. And if they are actually using anti-gravity technology, it would be the envelope that they're actually contained within. Unfortunately, we've never found anti-graviton jets, so it's only a theory. But uh, definitely, and you can go all the way back to John Keel in the 1960s, who was the first person who who uh, tried to describe this phenomenon of some sort of blue or orange or red uh, uh, fields around or glows around these objects. And uh, the, the consensus today is that it's probably something to do with the propulsion system. How about that? Luminosity is a really good word for it. That's mm -hmm. basically what I, would, what I would consider it to be. But 
and that's strange that uh, they they come in different colors. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and all these things. You you know, I can I had never heard of another gold one, but you have heard gold before. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it was very very bright and uh, looked like you know. In some cases, though, it, depending on the time of day, if these people are seeing these silver spheres and the sun is going down. In some cases, it may appear golden or copper to them when it's in actuality uh, a silver sphere. And it's just the setting sun gives it that uh, shade of red or shade of gold. Now, here's another question, but it's totally on speculation. And that is, uh, you mentioned the change in what people are seeing. You know, the orbs of light, points of light, mm -hmm. uh, spheres, uh, triangles, discs, or cigar shape. Why do you suppose that they the different shapes come along well i'll tell you something me and um shara costa basically came to a conclusion uh, independently and i talked to her about it a couple of years ago you never get orbs in march and our joke was that maybe march is when orbs are down for maintenance okay <laughs> um so uh if if say there's more than one type of visitor coming from more than one type of place. Uh, I think that that has a lot to do with it. Uh, are triangles the replacements for cylinders? Because there are certainly a number of correlations from older cylinder cases uh, with, with blue beams and white beams shooting down from them that compare to triangles with blue beams and white beams shooting down from them. So is somebody updating their model to the, you know, 2000, 23 you know flying saucer or you know is it that there's lots of different visitors coming from lots of different places uh, and i think either of those theories are valid yes and uh someone was just talking about this was pretty amazing during the 1990s the belgium triangle wave and i mean they all look very similar similar to the triangles that but they were smaller i do believe right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they, they had blunt ends. They weren't exactly pointed. Uh, and if, in our little gallery of drawings, we find several different variations in triangles, uh, which is pretty interesting. Oops. Another yeah. interesting thing about triangles is people will either describe them as having a flat matte finish on the bottom, or they'll describe tubing and all sorts of intricate patterns on the bottom. And so we have those different types of, of triangles. There's also triangles that are thicker than other triangles. When people see the triangle moving away, sometimes the triangle's very thin, sometimes the triangle's very thick. Okay, sometimes they have three lights in the back, sometimes they don't. People describe uh, triangles as having uh, only amber lights. And in our sketch gallery from the witnesses, we've discovered that there's an inordinate amount of triangles that actually have pink lights. So there are many, many variations in the types of triangles that we're seeing, especially in witness sketches. That's amazing. You you really know your your craft. I'm going to tell you, tell you a story of a, a guy that I, a friend of mine who's been on the Antiques Roadshow uh, for many years, and we were sharing an office together, and I told him I did a show on UFOs, and then he told me his story, which blew my mind, uh, that he was a, at college in a tower in Amherst University in Massachusetts, and this square box came in. It, he said it was like a box, and it was down about the 17th floor, and it just was floating there, and it had lights blinking all the way around it on all the corners and in the center. Then it shot up into the sky and they saw a uh, jet fighter come toward it and then it burst into five lights and then the lights made a pattern in between themselves and then the lights shot off and the jet went after it but it couldn't keep up with it i mean that is such a bizarre thing have you ever heard of something other than uh, Rendlesham Forest, I've never heard of anything bursting into lights. Yes, I, I, I have also, uh, I know about the boxes too. Are, are you familiar with Katie Page from MUFON or Colorado? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. She has a phenomenal story from when she was a child and she was living on a, a farm. And oh, yes. there was a lot of interesting things. Colorado. Going on. 
Colorado. And the boxes, the black boxes kept showing up on the farm. And what was interesting was I was going through one of the old 1970s uh, UFO magazines, which is when Katie's uh, occurrences happened. And I actually found a correlating case article about another black box in the 70s, not in Colorado. I believe it was Iowa. It was fairly close by. And I ended up sending it to her because it was such a close match to what was happening on the farm where she was living. But we we, we also have, um, I wouldn't say a lot, but I'd say we probably have maybe eight or nine black box, small black box stories in the MUFON uh, case management system. Now, how often, I mean, I could go on just the shapes and things of what people are seeing. Uh, I could go on for a while about that. But um, I heard of one recently, which is one I've heard before, uh, barbell shaped. You get those every once in a while, right? Yes. And, uh, you know, if I had a little more time at the symposium, I would have added barbells in this year. I'm actually working on an article on barbells. We had a phenomenal case back in 2014 of, uh, I, I believe it was 2014, 2015. There were some hunters way, way up in Ontario, and they saw this massive dumbbell shaped object. Yes, Very I'm familiar with that case. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's not the only one that we found. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, when I was researching the octagons, I came across a report from the Yukon, and it was actually a massive uh, dumbbell with two octagon, red octagon shaped lights at each end of it. And it was also the size of the object that was seen in Ontario. I'm under the impression it might have been the same object because, again, it was in a remote part of Canada. What's really, really interesting about that case is that 15 miles away uh, in 2016, we had a report from a place called Haas Lake where a guy filming auto, autumn foliage with his drone in at the middle of absolutely nowhere in the uh, Canadian forest. He was accosted by an object coming out of the trees that seemed to be small and disc shaped. Again, smaller than a Volkswagen Beetle. Now, like wait a minute. Where where was this? Where did this take place? Uh, a Haas Lake. Uh, I it was uh, Saskatchewan. It was like um, thirty miles west of Saskatchewan in a place called Haas Lake, and the 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 dumbbell shaped object was was only. 15 miles from this small disc that accosted the drone and the disc when it came out of the forest and passed the drone as if looking to see what it was and surveilling it uh we took the, the video apart frame by frame and the thing was going mach 7 5,000 miles per hour Jeez. so Five, 15 miles away from that, we have a massive dumbbell object. Uh, and it seems to be that that they like the Canadian wilderness, the far north, because there's probably a lot of cover for a very large dumbbell object. All right. I would like to talk a little longer. Uh, right now, I want to say goodbye to everyone over at KGRA Radio. Hopefully, we'll be back with James Fox next week. He is very busy, so he couldn't commit to me by the time the show started. But I'll have another guest if it's not James Fox. But thank you, everyone, over at KGRA Radio. I'd like to continue on this conversation because can you describe a little bit? Uh, just a minute ago, you talked about something coming out of the trees. And I'd like to hear a little more detail about that because I have been contacted by an ex-military person that has a ranch in New Mexico that described almost identical what you were talking about. Yes, the, we call them fast movers, and they're pretty small. They're smaller than, a, a, than a, in some cases, a car engine. Uh, one of the cases of interest is we had one over the Atlantic Ocean this past summer, some June 5th, I believe it was, of 2022. A uh, plane was coming from Rhode Island making an approach to uh, Philadelphia International Airport over the Atlantic, incidentally, 20 miles out from McGuire Air Force Base, which is a UFO hotbed over the decades. And it almost collided with him. And he said, had it collided with us, even a glancing blow, it would have been catastrophic. Okay. The object that I described to you in the video uh, from Haas Lake, three months later in, I believe it's Almere, South Carolina or North Carolina. Um, you might know because that's the jury. I can't think of the name of the town. It begins with a small town. Somebody else's drone three months later 
filmed the exact same object that was filmed over Haas Lake, smaller than a Volkswagen Beetle, flying at approximately Mach 7. If you go on YouTube, there are actually more videos, all right, from, from um, the Netherlands, from Wisconsin, from uh, upstate New York, of these same small objects that are traveling so fast that you have to slow down the videos to see them. And they're all the size of car engine blocks to the size of small Volkswagen Beetles. Crazy stuff. Now, what about out of the trees? You said this came something? Yeah, came what, what, if the video is, it's a very short clip. It's only like 12 seconds long, but it, it either was coming along the tops of the trees and came up to meet this drone that was taking photographs of the autumn foliage, or it shot right out of the trees. If it shot out of the trees, that would suggest it was going from zero to 5,000 miles per hour in a, a quarter of a mile. That would be insane, all right? The other possibility is that it was flying along low over the treetops, saw the drone, and came up to within five feet of it to surveil it to see if it was if it posed some sort of threat to it so there's a lot of stuff going on in the wilderness of Ca of, of upper canada i can tell you that for sure well this particular story i think is fascinating i'm trying to get him and his military buddy that was visiting him on this ranch they're walking the dogs uh late at night it was about two in the morning or something like that out under the moonlight and they came up onto this tree on a ridge and they felt like a presence or saw something in the tree. They thought they saw eyes or something. And then these things came out of the trees and then they, sh they came at them and stopped and then shot off. And it just, it wasn't like a, any type of animal, a bird or something. It's really bizarre stuff. And I love the bizarre ones. Those are my favorites. Now there was a woman that talked about a barbell experience. I believe, um, Michael uh, Schratt uh, was talking about it where there was a barbell and, and uh, hovering above her and she saw what looked like a muffler shop, all these things hanging inside of a door. Did you ever hear about that one? That one's a bit. No, but it, it sounds it sounds similar to what I was talking about before with the triangles, that there are some triangles that seem to have tubular structures, I mean, very complicated tubular structures. And also the, uh, I believe the object that was shot down over, allegedly shot down over Lake Huron had some sort of strings hanging down from it. And there's also people who have filmed what look like jellyfish objects yes. that seem to have yeah. appendages hanging down. I know somebody in the, in the chat mentioned that earlier. So what are these things hanging down off these objects is interesting antennae or uh, is, is it alive or what? I know. Well, uh, yeah, the jellyfish type type thing. And, you know, people have actually people who have talked about, you know, experiences have talked about that they felt like the craft was organic and alive. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember Denise Stoner actually talked about a situation like that mm -hmm. uh, from Florida. Um, and, but, but a lot of people have talked about the possibility of things being alive and activated through, you know, like a mind thing, which is really something to think about what now tell me if you would, some of the, we're, we're talking about all these different types of UFOs, which I love the, that topic. That's why I'm continuing on a little bit longer than normal. But what are some of the ones that are one-offs, ones you've heard, like you've never heard of another one like it? Another, another one that I've only seen one of a kind that off the top of my head that'd be difficult to answer there. There's um, a very, very rare one. That's, that's almost like a half, dumbbell all right it's a very large knob on the front and then like a tubular structure behind it and i've only seen like three of these but they're also very large like the dumbbells there's a very famous apro journal picture drawing of one and it has multiple like lights or portholes in the front of it and this was from alabama in the 1960s or 70s and we actually have two drawings in our database that match that 
Afro Alabama sighting 60 years ago, uh, almost to a T. But I've only seen three uh, drawings of this half dumbbell shaped object. So that that's a bizarre one. Now, how much overlap is there with New Fork, Peter Davenport? Well, th that's an interesting question. There's really none. The, the issue with Peter is that he's pretty much a two-man operation, and they just collect uh, UFO reports. But Fran Ridge acted as a, uh, a mediator, and when he was working with his MADAR project, he convinced MUFON and New Fork to do to join something called Project Match. Whereas if Fran comes across a very, very interesting New Fork case that deserves to be investigated, it shouldn't go to the dustbin of history. He forwards it to MUFON, and if MUFON decides to investigate it, New Fork will give MUFON the witness information, and we will investigate it on behalf of NICAP and New Fork. That's called Project Match, and that's a three-way deal between MUFON, NICAP, and and new fork now you mentioned earlier in the historic cases that someone will report you know going way back like for instance that cross that was lit up in this in the sky that type of thing as being like the first type of report um when someone is going back and thinking about their ufo sighting they're not able to get most people would not be able to get the the date um, sometimes not even the year. So how do you handle reports that come in like that? Well, it, 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 they're interesting, and and I take a special interest in them because I like to research. So, for example, in the 1930s, there was a series of uh, glass globe UFOs where an, an old man with a beard in a red suit was in some sort of glass globe just he was seen observing an outdoor play like and santa it, claus or something you're talking it, no like he was in a uniform <laughs> and then several years later yeah I, I miss jokes a lot um several years later the same fellow was seen again all right in another part of the world and this phenomenon went on all the way up until the famous canary islands sighting all right and the way we figured that out is because um if one one report triggers your your memory and you can go to say albert rosales's books again or uh passport to magonia and find older correlating cases or even in peter davenport's new fork database i actually have the entire kufos spreadsheet of two hundred thousand cases um there's plenty of places you can go to find correlating cases and that's pretty much the only way you can investigate if uh, something from 1963 uh, might have been an ongoing phenomenon back then. You could go to the NICAP chronology on Fran Ridge's website, and that's the way I do it with historical cases. I will look at all the other databases to see if there were other similar occurrences in that time frame of history, and, and pretty much I almost always get a hit. How about that? Now, my the Charles Lear, who does my blogs for me, he also wrote the book, The Flying Saucer Investigators. Uh, he does a lot of research, and he's always, you know, the case I mentioned today was a 1970 case in Spain. Um, he's always digging in to uh, do research for the blogs that he does for my website, and I very much appreciate his great work. Um, would someone like him have more access if they joined uh i'm not sure if he's a member of mufon but would he have more access to historic uh cases or where do you you just mentioned a website you looked at what was that website? oh sure uh, well i'll tell you that uh, it's like i pretty much have i'm crazy this way i've pretty much looked at all 132,000 cases all right and there's <laughs> there's a significant amount of cases prior to 1947 in roswell i mean there's a lot of cases that are before 1947. But here's the thing. MUFON's, MUFON's a great place to go, all right, because we have 132,000 cases. Peter Davenport, his um, database has 170,000 cases, all right? Uh, the NICAP chronology has 6,000 cases. A lot of them are military cases. And KUFOS, if you go to the KUFOS website, you can actually purchase a disc that has 
their um, chronology. It'll give you the date, time, source, place, and a short description. And they've got over 200,000 entries. And I, it used to cost like 60 bucks for the disc. I don't know how much it costs now. But if you take the 200,000 Kufos cases, the 6,000 NICAP cases, the 170,000 New Fork cases, the 132,000 MUFON cases, throw in Jacques Vallée, Albert Rosales, and all of those guys, you have an endless, an endless amount of material to draw correlations and conclusions from. I wonder if there's a way to figure out how many recorded UFO reports there have been over all the years. It must be in the millions. It's oh, I, for sure. I mean, UFO reports go back 5,000 years. I mean, you know, Tutmos III, everyone's familiar with the fire rings that came over, you know, Cairo or wherever he was 3,500 years ago. But that wasn't the only thing that happened with Tutmos 3,500 years, years ago. He was in a battle against uh, a rebel army, and he was a great general. He was the most successful pharaoh um, of, of them all militarily. He won 45 45 uh, battles without ever losing one. But in one case, an orb came down from the sky and decimated the army, the opposing army on the field without touching Tutmos's army. The same thing happened with the Romans and the Pontian Empire, which is modern day Turkey. The Romans were getting their butts kicked, all right? This object comes down between both armies. They both panic, run away. Rome regroups, goes on to rout the Pontians, and that's the reason why the Romans made it down into Israel. Had this object not come down and spooked both armies, allowed Rome to regroup, Romans may have never made it into, into Palestine or Israel. And, you know, what we know today about Christianity may never have happened. So that's why I, I, I agree with masters on a lot of stuff. I definitely think there's been influence all through history, including uh, UFOs interfering with military battles. How about that? Now, the thing you just mentioned there, that whole encounter, um, I would imagine that back then everything was explained through you know, uh, God or, or something like that. Or, uh, you know, I mean, did they try to explain these things in journals of how, what they thought, like God was on their side or something? Um, I, no, because I mean, the records are so scant from back then, yeah. but the thing that's interesting is the, uh, the battle that, uh, the white orb came down and decimated the, the rebel army uh, that was fighting against Tutmos. That has been preserved in a stone called the Gebel Barkel Stella. A stella is a stone that's carved and tells a story. So the entire encounter is called the Miracle of the Star. And that's documented. That's in a museum. There's no way around saying that that's a hoax or a, a mis misidentification 3,500 years ago. Right. I know there is one. I'm trying to think who it was. Uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, and that that can only be chased back to 1953 in a book. In That's words, right. Yeah. That's right. It was yeah. Flying Sauce is serious business. There's no prior there's no prior record of that account prior to, to that book. Um, Frank Edwards. Yep. So that's that's something to keep in mind when you hear things. You know out there i mean they get repeated and then they become a truth in a type of way a lot of times uh, here's a question that came in here does mufon have a budget for investigations um we're big in name but we're we're small in uh we're small in budget uh no pretty much uh we depend on uh, investigators in a certain area to actually have their own equipment and go out to the field. And you don't always go out to the field. A lot of times you, you just, it, it, we investigate UFO reports, not UFOs, because by the time we get the reports, sometimes weeks, sometimes decades have passed. So you can only, you can only go out and, you know, look for radiation if, if, you get the report and the next day you can get out there. So a lot of times uh, there's no way we can actually go out in the field and investigate something because a lot of time has passed. So MUFON doesn't really have a budget for that. The, the only time we really, um, we survive on memberships and people becoming field investigators uh, and, and the symposium, but big in name, we're, we're not big, 
we're not like a big corporation that has a, a, a huge amount of money to go give out to people all over the country to do investigations. No. Now, one question that uh, a number of people have asked me over the years, does the government have access to MUFON files? Um, pretty much all the government has to do is purchase a $6 a month MUFON membership and they get member access to the CMS. Uh, so, and if the government really, you know, is dead set on getting anybody's information, I, I you know, I'm sure the CIA could suck it out without us ever even knowing, you know, so. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so this question, I do believe you more or less talked about um uh do you plan on combining databases of old cases with those of nicap etc to make one large shared case book now i know uh david marler is doing some great work on some archives and a lot of that's going to be digitized at some point and um, is that the goal of all these collections that you're aware of yeah here, here's the thing Mufon and and David Mahler and Kufos and New Fork and everybody else, we're grassroots organizations. We try to present the public face. We try to give as much information as we can to the public. We try to be transparent. We're in competition now because now there's there's corporations are, are, are getting involved and the government is suddenly interested, even though, you know, we've been tinfoil hat conspiracists for, for, for 80 years. So we have more competition. The problem with combining databases is that the system that that MUFON uses is absolutely totally different than the system that uh, Peter Davenport uses. All right. So you cannot logically integrate all of these these databases without spending an awful lot of money. So what we've been reaching out at MUFON to do is we have something called the Project Aquarius Virtual Library. Phase one is going to be the release of about 9,000 historic paper MUFON reports prior to our computerized system. Second room is probably going to be our sketch drawings from witnesses. The third stage is going to be a very complex multi-leveled map and it's going to have the cms as the top rung it's going to have the nicap chronology we've already made an agreement with fran ridge to take his cases and put them into a map at another level uh we've reached out to new fork uh they're not with us yet but i'm hopeful uh afu in sweden is working on giving us the Norwegian and Swedish databases. So while we can't technically integrate all of these different databases, we can make them all into a multi-leveled map so that you can go from the, 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 the MUFON level to the NICAP level to the Swedish level, and you can do comparisons. And we will have search fields that will allow you to look at information on different levels of the map it, it's going to be fascinating when it's done but that's the only way we're going to actually be able to integrate anybody's database that wishes to join move on and help us create this map that's great i mean the more technology we get the better we can have all this information available mm -hmm. and people like visuals uh, which is why i'm yes. keen on the map and what do you, what do you think what is your opinion of uh, since I have you, and we're about ready to wrap up here in a few minutes, but what is your opinion of David Grush's claims of the possibility of the crashed? Now, I'm asking you for a speculative, you know, answer. This is just speculation. But yes, uh, uh, yeah, okay. what, are you, what are your thoughts when you when you hear the, that whole thing? Uh, clearly, the guy knows something. All right, uh, I'm one of those people that say, you know, show me, show me the money. All right, because, uh, you know, I've been hearing that that we've had crash debris and uh, that alien bodies uh, since I'm a kid. All right, um, so but th what's different this time is that he said it under oath, and yeah. I would tend to believe that if you're going to go in front of Congress and say, you know. I know, and I'll talk to you guys in the skiff, and I'll give you the hostile and the friendly witnesses who know for sure. Y you know, I'd have to say, yes, uh, the guy's probably on to something. But at the same time, I wonder, would the government really allow this guy to go, you know, and just spill the beans without, w with 
their permission. I don't know. I tend to like uh, the two pilots, uh, Fravor and what's his name? Graham. Ryan Graves. Graves, 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 because there's there's radar imagery to back it up. I like hard evidence, but Grush surely knows something, and maybe you know Congress now knows more than we the public know. But definitely things are are going our way. That's for sure. You know, when I first heard the idea of you know crashed uh, alien craft. You know, it's like, oh, no, like that's going way too far for someone to talk about, you know, like that um, in this in the position he was in. But, you know, I mean, I'm I'm going to remain open minded to it uh, because if anything else, some people may come forward that actually talk to him to begin with. Um, it really depends on how he's treated, how people feel as though he's treated um, for those firsthand witnesses, whether they feel comfortable or not actually talking about it so we'll we'll just see if that it all comes to fruition you know um open-minded but a little bit on the skeptical side i, I would I'm, I'm in your camp yeah it's like i'm hopeful all right but uh, i'm an evidence-based nuts and bolts guy so you know uh, i'm just cautiously optimistic at this point yeah yeah but it's definitely caused a lot of attention to this topic and, you know, uh, there's like a hundred UFO shows starting a week <laughs> and on, on YouTube. It's like there's, uh, you can go on YouTube now and there's like uh, hundreds and hundreds of people doing shows on UFO, uh, you know, more and more every week. So, uh, so that being said, I want to thank everyone that listens to this show and uh, people that have been with me all along here. I really appreciate it. Bob, I'm looking forward to seeing you out in Cincinnati. Me too. I can't wait to see you. Thank you so much for having me today. I, I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. And I really enjoyed talking about the different crafts. That's really kind of exciting to, to hear these different things. Okay. So, all right. Excellent. We'll see you in a few weeks. All right. Take care. All right, everyone. So I will be back next week, hopefully with James Fox, if not with someone else. And remember everyone to keep your eyes to the sky and your minds open but not too wide. Here we go.